games that push the limits of the ZX Spectrum. The humble Specky, a machine with a lot of limits to push really, not the most powerful machine you could buy at any point in its life. It still became a massive and fairly enduring success here in the UK and much of Europe too. Massive sales potential meant that there were plenty of developers who were willing to take the spectrum to the edge of what it could do, and perhaps shoehorn games into it that you might not expect to fit. I'm going to take a look at a few of those games that do what back then seemed impossible, and how else could I start off than with Night Lore, a game that wowed the crowd and set faces to stun on its release in late 1984? It may not be very colourful, but its large and richly detailed 3D world was unlike anything anyone had seen before on any system, let alone the Spectrum. So much so, in fact, that creators the Stamper Brothers actually sat on this game for a good 12 months before releasing it, for fear of overshadowing games they already had in the pipeline for release. So very many games came after it that, well, borrowed this isometric style that it's easy to forget just how innovative and technically impressive this game is, and what an achievement it was to get this running on a 48k Spectrum so well. Playing it now, well, perhaps time has not been all that kind to this game. The controls don't feel that good. It's a bit clunky and awkward, especially compared to more modern platformers, but still, it's worth a play, particularly if you're a fan of those 8-bit classics. And yes, it does remain iconic, at least in the world of classic British gaming. Next up, another game that broke new ground in 3D from just a year later, Eye of the Mask, a surreal and not a little baffling 3D maze shooter hybrid that even its creator admitted was more about graphics technology than playability. Probably inspired by Atari's massively groundbreaking, but also massively unsuccessful as it turned out, arcade game iRobot, Eye of the Mask was one of the very earliest games to feature polygonal 3D graphics on any home system. And yes, it is plagued by the same problems that people complain about to this very day. Frame rate issues, object popping and screen tearing are all in evidence. But considering that this is running on a 3.5 MHz Z80 with 48K of RAM, it is pretty amazing. I honestly can't think of another game on this or even any other similar system that threw around the geometry so well. It even features some rudimentary lighting effects. Now looking at this footage, you might be wondering what the hell is going on in this game. And to be frank, so am I. And I have spent quite some time trying to work it out. Our walkthrough and even the dreaded manual haven't been much help. And that is the trouble sadly. For all its innovation, this is really not that good of a game. In fact, Programmer Sandy White said it himself in a recent Eurogamer interview. In his own words, It's fair to say that I was way more interested in the technology of generating the graphics than in the game itself at this point. And yes, it shows in the gameplay. It really feels more like an unfinished tech demo than a complete game. The controls are unresponsive to the point that it hardly feels like you're playing at all. Impressive, but not a lot of fun. Worth a look for the novelty of seeing this type of graphics on the spectrum, but sadly, not much else. And now, something slightly more gameplay focused, Star Strike 2, a game that is almost as ambitious as Eye of the Mask with its graphics, but manages to bring in an awful lot more in the way of actual game too. The original Star Strike was a great title with no doubt, fondly remembered in its own right, Star Strike 2 though ups the ante in every way. In the same vein as the Star Wars Vector Graphics arcade games, this is a first person 3D space shooter that manages to come as close to an arcade experience as you could reasonably expect to have on the old Specky. A mixture of wireframe style vector graphics and solid polygons make this another early but pretty successful attempt at creating a 3D world, one that's all the more impressive running as well as it does on such a modest machine. Admittedly, the frame rate varies between the very low and the 
extremely low as the action gets more intense. But if you're charitably inclined to these old games, as you probably are if you're watching this video, it never becomes unplayably slow. There's a lot going on here to be impressed by, but the standout moment for me would have to be the last stage of every level where you finally infiltrate the enemy planets. A souped up version of the Star Wars trench scene, dodging the weird but handily avoidable barriers before delivering the coup de grace to the aliens combi boiler, or whatever it is that powers their civilization. Just about everything in this game is done well considering the system that it's on. Their controls are refreshingly fluid and intuitive, especially after playing Eye of the Mask, and it gives you a lot of freedom of movement. This is never really a rails shooter. And if you can get used to the frame rate, it stands up pretty well today as what it is, a snappy arcade style space shooter. Moving away from 3D now into an area that's perhaps a bit closer to the type of games that the Spectrum is most often remembered for these days, it's R-Type. By 1988, the year of this game's release, the Specky was maybe starting to look a little bit long in the tooth, certainly when compared to the 16-bit machines that were fast gaining popularity. How well could you expect it to handle a real powerhouse of 2D pixel art like our type Well, with surprising success as it turns out. Okay, the graphics have had a bit of a downgrade in both detail and colour, and at times it does get a little bit bogged down and fairly chug along, but this version of the game is more notable for what is left in than what is left out. It's fast, it's still reasonably colourful, all the levels are here and all those bosses, including the giant spaceship that takes up most of level 3, all rendered surprisingly faithfully to the original arcade version. Yes, it's brutally difficult, I did cheat just a little to show you the later levels, and it doesn't make use of the 128k machine's expanded memory, so each level loads from cassette individually and at length on the original hardware, but none of these things really detract from it enough to stop it from being one of the very best games on the spectrum and essential if you're a fan of the platform. Programmer Bob Pate did an absolutely stunning job here, really pushing the spectrum to the edge of what it can do, while still being fun to play. In fact, he wrote a book about creating this game, which I will link to below, worth checking out if you are interested, as it does give far more detail than I could hope to here. And now a game that doesn't so much push the limits of the ZX Spectrum, but run headlong into them at full speed. Yes, hard driving was perhaps too much to ask of this system. You only need to look at it to see what I'm talking about. Build as the real driving simulator, the arcade original was absolutely state of the art when it came out, with amazing, for the time, 3D graphics and a hugely innovative physics engine. About the most sophisticated game around on its release, even the 16-bit system struggled with ports of this one, the Spectrum never had a chance. The frame rate, well, it's glacial, deteriorating to a virtual slideshow at times. The graphics are glitchy. The track, the scenery, the background, other cars appear and disappear at random. And my god, if anything, it plays even worse than it looks. The controls are sluggish and vague to the point of it being basically unplayable. Now all this doesn't mean that it's not impressive, because it really is. The developers were hugely ambitious in their attempt to bring this to an ageing 8-bit computer. They didn't pull it off, not quite, but considering what they had to work with, you really have to take your hat off to them, even if in the end it's not really a great experience. They pretty much did all they could to recreate all the features of the arcade, including the stunt track with its loop the loop and even the instant replay feature, something you'll be seeing a lot of considering how hard it is to stay on the track. The Spectrum was never built to play games like this, 3D worlds and physics engines were surely beyond its capabilities, but that didn't stop binary design from giving it a go, even if they did push things past their breaking point in the attempt. And finally, back into the realm of 2D once again. A game from the very tail end of the Spectrum's life as a commercial system, it's extreme from digital integration. Created by two-man team Dave Perry and Nick Bruti, this game is everything so many Spectrum games are not. It's fast, it's fluid, and most of all, it's colourful. Very much so. I could have done this entire video featuring the output of this pair, masters as they were, of squeezing every last drop of performance out of the old rubber-keyed wonder. But Extreme, I think, is probably the pinnacle of what they did. 
This game doesn't really do anything that hasn't been done before in terms of graphics and effects, but this really dials it all up to 11, pulling it off with the kind of flair that was rarely matched in the world of these old school computers. Huge multi-directional scrolling levels, massive sprites, brilliant pixel art, particle effects, great intro music, and no appearance of that demon colour clash. All you could expect from an 8-bit system of this age really, stuff that would tax even much more powerful platforms, done without missing a beat. It's true, the game isn't really that long, there's only three levels and if you know what you're doing, you can complete it in not much more than 10 minutes. Though it's difficult, it will pad out the playtime for quite a bit more than that and it does at times feel a little bit cheap. Ultimately though, Extreme is exactly what this game is. The extreme of what the Spectrum was able to do during its commercial lifespan. This is going to be the end of my list for the time being. No one seems to know exactly how many games came out on the Spectrum for sure, more than 10,000 though easily, so naturally this is not going to be by any means definitive. There are many, many games I could have mentioned but didn't, in fact I've not even really scratched the surface. If you can think of any more that are worthy of consideration, well please let me know in the comment below. In fact, don't just keep it on the specy, I'm interested in games on any old school system that push things to the limits and I may feature it in a future video. For now though, goodbye and thanks for watching.